this Sunday, we're going to look at what a saviour we have in Jesus. What a saviour we have. And, and I think our CL just now has uh, announced what the scripture passage is from. It's taken from John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. And this is a very, uh, it's a very popular story, you know, a very popular story that I think most of us have heard before. But before we go any further, I'll just invite our scripture reader, Eleanor, to come up and read the scripture to us this morning. Eleanor, uh, John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. And if you all have your Bibles, please keep it open to John 8, 1 to 11. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 1 to 11. This is the ESV version. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Eleanor. Now, this is a very uh, popular story that I think we have heard many, many times, you know. And I'm sure we are very, very familiar with the story. And sometimes we are also very familiar with the lessons within the story. Well, if you have heard what I'm going to preach today, let it serve as a reminder for you. But today as well, as I approach this passage of John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, I decided that I'm not going to look at, you know, the, the, the general mainframe of the story. Because there are so many other minor details within the story that we sometimes miss out. We do ask a question or two about why is this you know, detail included, but, but we don't really go any further than asking, oh, why is it here? All right, I don't have the answer, so that's it. It doesn't really provide uh, you know, much significance to the, to the main message that you know, John is trying to bring across by inserting this story in his gospel. And so we, we, brought, we skip across some of these very important details. But today we're going to look at three details that, 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 that really stands out, that really brings about this concept of what a saviour we have in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to very quickly bring to you the three things that we oftentimes miss out. And the first one is a teacher. Now, we look at, uh, you know, verses 1 to 2 of this passage and we see that Jesus was teaching. Now, just hold on for a minute. Let me get my, my Bible verse out, all right? It says that Jesus was teaching the crowds. And, and we, 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 we may not think that this is a very important uh, aspect of the story. But you have to understand that when John writes this story, he writes certain details to let us know or to give us a better picture or a better understanding of who this person named Jesus really is. And when he writes that Jesus was teaching, look at what he says in verse 2, early in the morning, he came to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Now we have to go back to the, the times of Jesus. And, and when we look at the, the times of Jesus, the tradition in those days is very much steeped in the teaching and the learning of the scriptures in the temple. In today's world, we send our children to school and they have their learning in the school. But for most of us, our learning stops the day we graduate from university, right? Right? Technically, all right, the formal learning. The, the workplace learning is very different. It's a different kind of learning. But in the Jewish society, 
Learning never stops. The kind of formal learning. And learning is not just, you know, earning a degree, but the learning that they do is very much the learning of the Scriptures. It's a daily routine for some people. It's a more formal process for others, for those who are being selected to be trained as, you know, the leaders, as the Pharisees, as the future teachers of the law. And that's why you see, you know, Jesus was actually following the status quo of that time when he selected 12 disciples to follow him. Because back in those days, it's not an uncommon sight for a Pharisee, a teacher of the law, or a rabbi to actually pick followers who would follow him and have, you know, this very close interaction with their teacher. And later on, they would assume this role of being rabbis themselves and create their own group of followers. And so this is the thing that Jesus was doing as well. Having grown up in this system and being raised up as a rabbi, he is now teaching the people. But there is also something else about the Jewish aspect of being a teacher. Because a teacher doesn't just pass down formulas of the scripture. The teacher doesn't just pass down head knowledge of the scriptures. The, the teacher passes down his lifestyle to the students, to the followers. And so you have to imagine for a moment when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, as they taught the people, they were also showing the people the lifestyle to live. And unfortunately, when we look at the scriptures, we do not see that the Pharisees were teachers. And when I say that they were not teachers, they could teach the formulas of the scripture. They could teach history from the Torah. But at the end of the day, when it came to passing down a lifestyle, a godly lifestyle, the Pharisees failed miserably. We don't have to look far. Just look at this passage of John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, and we see what kind of lifestyle they were showing to the people. John tells us that there was a crowd and in the midst of this crowd, here comes this Pharisees, a rowdy, loudmouthed bunch of people dragging this woman. And when they say dragging this woman, it's literally dragging this woman before Jesus in front of these people. And this was the lifestyle that the, the Pharisees were showing. The, the people that were gathered there, dragging this woman, throwing her at the feet of Jesus and saying, Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, not only were they showing a bad example of how not to behave as a spiritual leader, they were telling an outright lie. How could this woman be accused of being an adulteress when her official job status is as a prostitute? You get my point? There's no way you can ever accuse her of being an adulteress when she is already a prostitute. That's her job description. The one who was committing adultery was actually the man. But where was the man? And so the, the teachers of the law, was, when they mentioned this, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Jesus saw right through them. And so the Pharisees, they could teach formulas, but they could not pass down a godly lifestyle. But when we look at the Scriptures, when the, the Scriptures tell us that Jesus was a teacher, that Jesus taught the crowds, Mark chapter 1 tells us something very powerful that Jesus taught with authority. When he says Jesus taught with authority, it doesn't mean that he was loud-mouthed. It doesn't mean that, you know, everyone was forced to listen to him because of his status as a rabbi. But when he says that Jesus taught with authority, it meant that 
His authority came from God, being the Son of God, but His authority also came from the way He lived His earthly life, from the way He carried Himself every day, from His daily interactions with the people all around Him. It carried authority. And right here, when John says that Jesus was a teacher and Jesus was teaching, it actually sets the foundation for the story, for the entire story as we move on, the encounter with the woman. And so we move on to the story. It says Jesus was teaching and as He was teaching, suddenly this group of Pharisees came with this woman accusing her of being adulterous and telling Jesus that the law states this woman must be stoned. Because of what she has been caught doing, she must be stoned. Now here is another instance of where the Pharisees messed up because not only the woman has to be stoned, but the man who was caught having an adultery or an affair with her also has to be trout equally. Go back to the Leviticus law. And so this is where the Pharisees sort of messed up. But Jesus did not focus on arguing or debating the law with them. He kept silent. And there's something that I think all of us as we read this story, we do it does catch our attention. There's something in this story, especially from verses 3 to 6. It happens twice. If it is not significant, why would John have included this detail in this story not once, but twice? And this detail is this detail of Jesus writing on the ground. So the woman was thrown at Jesus' feet. The accusations was, met, was, was read out. And the judgment was read out by the Pharisees. And they were waiting for a response from Jesus. And here goes Jesus. Then the scripture tells us very clearly, he bent to the ground and he began writing on the ground. I'm sure all of you are thinking, oh, today the pastor is going to explain to us what did Jesus write? Unfortunately, I do not know what did Jesus write. But, but I think the detail in this story or the, the significance of this action of writing in the ground is not so much in what Jesus was writing on the ground, but the entire picture. I'm not usually one who acts out in my sermon. But I think today to get the message of cross, I need to do something. And to write in the ground, if you read the scriptures, it literally says that Jesus got to the ground. He got to the ground and he's writing on the ground. The scriptures didn't tell us that he got up. Because later on, when John continues on, to, when John writes the same thing once again, it says he wrote on the ground. He was still bent on the ground and he did not get up. Jesus was on ground level the whole time. And what's, what's on the ground level? The woman. The woman who was thrown right before him and Jesus when the accusations were being read. He did not just remain standing. When Jesus writes on the ground, the entire action of Jesus getting down to ground level shows us his compassion towards the woman. And to say that Jesus is compassionate is an understatement because Jesus was full of compassion. He heard what the Pharisees were saying but all he could see was this poor woman. This poor, helpless woman who needs to be defended. Who needs someone not to tower over her, not to read out accusations over her, but someone who can just get to ground level and be silent with her. You have to notice one thing. When Jesus got to the ground, he did not speak a single thing. He did not even bother to ask the woman, what were you doing? What was your job? What is your job? 
Why did you do this? He didn't bother to ask anything at all. And all throughout the entire story, we do not see Jesus even once asking the woman, why did you do it? You know this is the law. Why did you do it? Not even once did Jesus ask her the why question. Or who are you? What is the nature of a job? No, nothing of this. He just got down to his knees and got down beside her. The picture of Jesus on the ground, writing on the ground, is a very clear contrast that John was trying to paint. The contrast that we see here is one, the saviour of the world, the son of God, the one who has all the right to judge and condemn, but yet remain silent. The one who had all the right to stand towering over the woman and even over the Pharisees in judgment, but yet he chose to get down to ground level with the woman. But the contrast we see here is the Pharisees. People who had no right to judge anyone whatsoever. People who have no right to bring condemnation upon anyone, yet here they were acting in self-righteousness, dragging this woman and accusing her of all the sins and how sinful this woman is and how she deserves judgment. When they themselves were actually under the judgment of God as well. And that's why Jesus... At the end of the day, he, he heard all these accusations, but from ground level, he asked one question and one question alone. Is any one of you without sin? If you are without sin, then go ahead, throw the first stone at this woman. And after that, Jesus continued to remain silent. The writing on the ground, the act of Jesus getting down, it shows us the compassion of Christ. We go on to the end of the story and here is where we see several things that Jesus said to the woman after the people had left, after the Pharisees who wanted to stone her and finally found no reason in which they could pick up a stone to stone this woman, they left. And when everyone had left, and I presume here when he says everyone had left, it didn't mean that the crowds that were gathered there to listen to Jesus had left as well. The crowds were probably still there. But the everyone here indicated the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, those who wanted you know, to, to, to see what Jesus would do, to put Jesus to a test, to find a reason to throw Jesus into prison or to even you know, arrest Him. And they couldn't have their uh, motives Met that morning, they decided, all right, fine, we'll leave. We'll find another time, another, another opportunity to trap Jesus. When everyone had left, which just means the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, Jesus now has this very personal conversation with this woman. And he asks her, finally, he talks to her. And he asks her only two questions. Woman, where is everyone? Where is everyone? The second question he asks her is, has no one condemned you? And finally, he said something that's so beautiful to her. Neither do I condemn you. This was exactly what the woman needed to hear. The woman was so accustomed to hearing, you are a sinner, you are an unclean person, away from me, don't touch me, don't come near me. Even though most of the time, the people that were telling her you were unclean were the ones visiting her in secret as well. What an irony. And that's why Jesus saw right through the intentions of the heart of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Because you don't just catch someone in the act of adultery by accident, right? The whole thing smells of a setup, and Jesus knows that. 
And here were these people walking on the street, calling this woman an unclean woman, even though deep down this woman knows you call me unclean, but you visit me most of the time. This woman was so accustomed to being called a sinner, not by her name, not being addressed in a respectful manner, but being addressed as, hey, sinner, prostitute, unclean woman. She was not being used to being welcomed. She was used to this aspect of being used. She was used to the aspect of being driven away, rejected. But here was a Savior, the Son of God, who got down to her level and accepted her. Accepted her by saying, I do not condemn you. What a powerful statement the woman has ever heard. And that statement changed her life. You may say, how do we know what happened to this woman in the future? Well, we know what happened in the future because you look at, you know, uh, the, the Gospel of Luke. It's not here. I'm supposed to put it in the slide. We see that this is the woman who later on came and anointed Jesus' feet with the most expensive perfume. Her life was indeed transformed. And if we didn't, if, if historians got it right, this was the very same woman that followed Jesus all the way to the cross. Followed the entire process of when Jesus was flogged and all the way to the point where Jesus was crucified on the cross, she was right there with Jesus when all his disciples had deserted him, this woman remained faithful to Jesus. And we know that these words of Jesus, I do not condemn you, sparked a hope in this woman. And that hope gave her a reason to live a different life. Jesus also said one more thing before he let her go. He says, neither do I condemn you. But finally, he said, from now on, sin no more. A lot of times we look at this sentence and we think that it is like a command. Go and don't sin anymore. I do not want to see you back here the next time. And this is largely because we bring in our Asian parenting culture into this verse. I'm serious. No joke. You know, this is what our parents would tell, at least my parents would tell me when I was growing up. All right, I forgive you, but make sure don't ever repeat this mistake again. And if you do repeat this mistake, well, you know the punishment is going to be two times worse, right? So if you're caught running in church, when I was growing up, at least for my case, if you're caught running in church, running about because it's not a good example to set as a pastor's kid. You know, I was a pastor's kid, by the way. So I shouldn't be running. And so if you're caught running once, my dad would tell me nicely and you get one stroke of the cane. But if the next week you're caught again, it increases, it multiplies to two times. And then the next week it goes up to maybe four times, six times. It just multiplies. And you get the message at the end of the day, better don't run. You can do anything else. You can commit any other crime except to run because it's already your fourth, fifth time, you know. Now sometimes we bring this concept into this scripture verse. And we think that this is what Jesus was telling the woman. You better not sin anymore. I don't want to see you back here again. Now, this is not what Jesus was telling this woman. But instead, what he was telling her is he was giving her a message of empowerment. You have to understand this woman has been accustomed to this thought or to this notion that my life cannot be better than what it already is. This woman is so accustomed, maybe from a young age growing up, because no one you know, applies to be a prostitute. Usually in those times, they grow up into this job. All right, because that was the culture back then. Women were a lot of time, a lot of times women were abused. And so you grow up into that job. And so this woman, you have to understand, she was so accustomed to this mindset that there is no other job for me. 
This woman is so accustomed to this mindset that, that, that I am always a sinner. I am born a sinner. I cannot not be a sinner. But here is Jesus giving her an empowerment and telling her that I do not condemn you and you can live a different life. You have the power to live a different life. You can do it because in the past, you haven't encountered me. But now Jesus is telling her, because you have encountered me, you have encountered the Son of God, now you can live a different life. Go and sin no more because you can do it. That is empowerment. That is telling the woman to rise up and go a different path right now. You don't have to be held back by your past. You don't have to be held back by your upbringing. You don't have to be held back by all the words of the people around you. You can go and you can live a better life in Christ. What a powerful story in John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Today, when we look at this Saviour, when we, when, we, when we study this person called Jesus from the story of John chapter 8, there are a few things that I want you to know. Jesus is your defense. When the devil comes and accuses you, saying you are not worthy, saying that you are a sinner, that you are an unclean person, that you are not the right person to ever step into church, that God doesn't love you, Jesus comes to your defense and Jesus says, you are loved. You are a child of God. You can change. You can be different. But the defense of Jesus also happens the day you believe in Christ. The day you believe in Christ and the devil goes to God and says, this person is a sinner and deserves the wrath of God. But Jesus comes to your defense as your advocate and Jesus says, no, he is a child of God. This person has been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this person is no longer a sinner, but righteous, pure, holy. Jesus is merciful as well. Just like how he showed mercy to that woman. And Jesus also showed mercy to the Pharisees, you know. By not pointing out their sins one by one, even though he could have, but he merely asked them, if any one of you is without sin, throw the first stone at her. Without having to say more or anything less. He spoke right through the hearts of the Pharisees that day. But that was an act of mercy. But the mercy that we see, you know, that really stands out in this story is the mercy that Jesus showed to this woman when he says, neither do I condemn you. This morning, if you come here and if you're feeling like you're the worst sinner on earth, remember these words of Jesus, neither do I condemn you. Jesus does not condemn you. When you step into church with your sins, no one condemns you. I said that last week, that in church is not just a place for okay people, people who are good, people who are, you know, who have a, a, a good moral life, then only you can step into church. But if your moral lifestyle doesn't meet the standards of what it means to come into church, then unfortunately, you can't step into this church. No, this is not what church is for. Church is for everyone. It's for the worst of the sinners. And if you are not okay and you are in church today, you are in the perfect place because this is where Jesus welcomes you. And this is where Jesus says, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, I do not condemn you. What a powerful message of the mercy of Jesus. And I pray that if we are Christians long enough, that we continue to remember and be thankful for the mercy of Christ. The mercy of Christ that does not condemn us, but welcomes us and says, come and experience the love of God. 
The mercy of Christ that does not look at our sins and numbers our sins and, and how many times we have done these sins and these wrongs, but the mercy of Christ that merely says, I do not condemn you. What a powerful message this is. I pray that if we are Christians long enough, we take hold of this message and we allow it to stir up that fire and that passion within our hearts to continue to love God, love Jesus for what He has done for us. If you know Christ, you have power in you as well. You are empowered. Empowered to be holy. Empowered to live life differently from what you knew in the past. If in the past you walked in hatred, in anger, in sin, after knowing Jesus, you have the power to come out of sin. You have the power to love power of Jesus will be in us. And all you need to do is say yes to Him. And say, God, I want to believe in You. I want to accept Your love for me. I want to accept Your mercy. Like the woman that day, in John 8, although we did not hear or read of her response, but we know from her life after this encounter that she responded positively to the invitation, the forgiveness, and the compassion of Jesus shown to her that day. What about us this morning? What about us this morning? I want to invite the worship team up here. As we conclude today's entire celebration, what will our response be to the love, to the compassion, the mercy, and the promise of Christ? I want to encourage all of you to just spend a few moments. Just close your eyes. Don't have to look left. Don't have to look right. And I'm going to ask just two questions. The first one is for Christians. It's, it's what we call the Holy Week this week. I don't, I don't really like to set a specific week in the year to be holy because every day is holy. But in the, in the Christian calendar, it's called Holy Week. I think allow it to lead us to deeper reflection. And this reflection is a question that I have been asking myself constantly, especially during the start of this year. And that question is, what is the position of God in my life? At this very point of my life, what is the position of God? Has God become religion to me? Where I merely just show up in church, I read my Bible, I pray, but it's, it's just become a religion. I no longer have this experience of God. I no longer feel His presence. And even though I don't feel His presence, it's okay. I think it's fine because Life is okay for me. And after all, a little bit of troubles, a little bit of hardships, that's to be expected. So what's the big deal? I don't need to feel God every day of my life. But maybe for some of us, when we ask ourselves this question right now, and if we were to honestly reflect, sometimes it can lead to a very shocking answer. Man, I have drifted so far, so far away from God. What is the position of God in your life? Just 
just want to tell you whatever or wherever God is in your life, you can always come back to Him. All you need to do is say, God, I want to come home. I want to restore this broken relationship that I have with you. I want to come back to you. Come back to my first love for you. Maybe some of you watching online or attending physically, you're in a position where you haven't even known God. Today is your first time you are hearing of who this God is, Jesus. You've heard this name Jesus probably a few times in your life, but you don't really know who Jesus really is. I've said this many times. You've heard people say this many times. You're not here by an accident. You are here like the woman that they thrown at Jesus' feet for a reason. And that reason is a good reason. You are here so that you can get to know who this Saviour is. If you're here for the very first time, you don't know who Jesus is, I encourage you, pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord, be my Saviour. Forgive me. Cleanse me and empower me to live a different life. I believe in you. I trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.